Oh, guys. Tom, we going? We good? Yeah. Fantastic. Today. Yeah. Yes. Yes, today. I don't know. It just started. Anytime I like slowly say one word, it's always, yes, a double milk pet, whatever. Um, so what we're doing, we are, oh, we're talking about one of my favorite subjects. One, th I am, I'm so excited for you guys to get to sit under this for the next two weeks because we're going to be talking about heaven, what heaven is and how you get there. All right. So today we're going to be focused on what it is. And oh my gosh, guys, when I was prepping this, I had probably nine pages of just quotes from books that I've read. And I was like, oh, I can't do that because it'll take 45 minutes just to read these things. But oh, my heart was just full this week as I was prepping for this and getting ready for this. Uh, and so hopefully uh, when you guys leave today, you'll have a better understanding, a more joyful understanding of what heaven actually is as we as we start this. OK, so I want to start off with this. Um, I asked my daughters last night what they think heaven will be like. And so hopefully the volume will work because this is really cool. So here we go. She's always out of focus like that. Don't worry. No. All right, here we go. Hey, Kinsley, when you think of heaven, what does it look like in your mind? All mansions and a big humongous cake with lots of fast roller coasters and then the biggest pool in the world. <laughs> <laughs> did you see the? Did you see right off the bat her eyebrow went up like ooh, ah, like this just it, it sparks her imagination. Here's Kyla at the dinner table. Big, big, ginormous pool and with a big slide and a roller coaster inside of the two slide and then the roller coaster falls into the water and then and then the roller coaster sinks and then. The roller coaster goes into the hole, into the hole, and then it goes underground, and then it comes out from the ground into the pool. That's heaven. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Is, what else is in heaven? What else does it look like when you think about it? Um, <laughs> a banana swimming in the <laughs> oh, aren't they cute oh my gosh so so this is what happens though like whenever we whenever we talk about heaven or we ask you to think about it our minds go one of two ways either we hyper imaginate if that's a word when we start talking about a theme park instead of heaven or we undervalue it and we're just kind of bored by it okay so where we are in the story right now today is we are beyond the story we're in the consummation of the story. We're in the finality of all things. We're, we're at the part of the, the story where heaven is the reward for you making your story part of his story. Okay, so let's pray and then we're going to jump in. All right, here we go. Daddy, we love you and we thank you so much that you have given us your word and you have given us a description of our final resting place and our great reward. And so I pray you would waken hearts and waken minds this morning as we look just in the beauty of what scripture teaches us. We love you in your name. Amen. All right, so when we think about heaven, uh, my daughters gave a real good, uh, just kind of like, ooh, ooh, ah, like just total imagination fest. Um, and when we think about it, a lot of times we think about gold and we think about clouds or we picture New Zealand or something like that. Something from like Lord of the Rings where like Gandalf is all in white. And it's like, oh, that's yeah. heaven. All the orcs are going to die now. Yay. Um, but I think there's a part of us though that when we sing, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing. God's praise and when we first begun we kind of go what we're gonna be singing for 10,000 years and that's only the start what Randy Alcorn an author uh, who I'm gonna reference a lot this morning he says we've settled on an image of the never-ending sing-along in the sky one great hymn after another forever and ever amen and our heart sinks forever and ever that's it that's the good news and then we sigh and we feel guilty that we're not more spiritual. We lose heart and we turn once more to the present to find what life we can. There's even a secular sci-fi author that lamented about the eternal boredom of heaven. He said it would be better just to no longer exist. 
than to have to experience the eternal boredom of heaven. But guys, could we be missing something when we think, because I know I've been there, like when I, when I picture heaven and I hear like 10,000 years of, it's like that just does not sound appealing. It doesn't sound like something I want to really devote my life to. I mean, we have a hard enough time singing out there. I mean, imagine doing it for all eternity. Really? Is that all our reward is? Maybe we are unaware that heaven is our reward is better than an eternal Sunday school. Randy Alcorn again says this, God made our taste buds, our adrenaline, our sex drives, and the nerve endings that convey pleasure to our brains. Likewise, our imaginations and our capacity for joy and exhilaration were made by the very God we accuse of being boring. Are we so arrogant as to imagine that human beings came up with the idea of having fun? See, what I want to do today is I want to hit the middle. I, want to, I don't want to stay over here where all we do is imagine all of these unimaginable things and then have heaven be some kind of weird, like, psychedelic trip. But I also don't want to talk about heaven is a place where we worship and we will love it and we will never stop because that's, that's just not where I want to be. So I want to hit the middle here. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> I want to hit the middle here. And what, what I hope happens today is if you kind of have this approach to heaven that it's just kind of like, ah, oh, heaven's neat. Um, after today, if you move a little bit beyond that, I got a book I want to recommend to you. It's, it's exhaustive, but not exhausting to read. It's, it's an exciting thing that it's going to just open your eyes to the beauty of this place. So let's talk about the physical description of heaven. I'm going to go ahead and just turn that off. All right. You guys, you guys see that picture. We're good. Hey, there we go. Turn it off now. Great. What's the most awe-inspiring physical place you've ever seen? Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon? What else? An awe-inspiring physical, natural wonder that you've been to or you've seen or you hope to go to. Like, what's something that you've been there and you say, oh, yeah. Yes, the biggest Walmart gets me every time, right in the fields. Uh, what else? Yeah. Yosemite. Yosemite. <gasps> My favorite place in the planet, dude. I love it. Yeah. The top of the Eiffel Tower. The top of the Eiffel Tower. Oh, man, what a beautiful sight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Lambeau Field in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Lambeau Field, yeah. I've been there too, man. It's awesome. Um, anything else? What are, what are some of those places? Yeah. Authority field at Wild <laughs> you guys are going to like football fields. What about, like, I'm talking like, let's, let's go nature here. What? The mountains in Wyoming. The mountains in Wyoming? Oh, awesome. Who knew there were mountains in Wyoming, right? And then they blow you away when you're there. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Pikes Peak. Pikes Peak, yeah. Did you drive to the top? No. You hiked it? Oh, you took the trade. Okay, that's that's good. That's good. But yeah, you're on top of a 14er, man. I mean, that's awesome. All of these places are amazing. And like in Yosemite, that's a jaw-dropping place. When you get into the valley for the first time, you see El Capitan over there, and then you're driving down, you see the falls, and then you hike up, and you see Half Dome, and you get to the Grand Canyon, and you see just the magnitude of it that can never be captured by pictures. When you get on top of the Eiffel Tower, and you see Paris just sprawl out with all of its lights, and every building's like the exact same height. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. You get to Lambeau, you see some Packer football. I mean, it's awesome. But here's what I want to point out. In Romans 8, 19 through 21, you don't have to turn there unless you want to, but Romans 8, 19 through 21 says this, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Now what this is saying is that the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, top of the Eiffel Tower, all of these places that we mentioned are decaying because of sin. But they're still so beautiful and so jaw-dropping and so awe-inspiring that I got a question for you. If the wrong side of heaven can be so beautiful, can you imagine what the right side looks like? So when we talk about heaven, the first thing I want to point out, we're going to be in Isaiah 65 a little bit. So if you want to go there, um, that'll be awesome. We'll also be in Revelation 21. They kind of piggyback off each other. But in Scripture... Heaven is mentioned as this new heaven and new earth. 
okay? A physical place, uh, not just some kind of psychedelic <laughs> trip that we go on in our minds like, whoa, man, that's totally cool. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, no, heaven is a physical place and scripture calls it new. It's a new heaven, a new earth. Um, are you guys at Isaiah 65? Go to about verse 17 uh, and just kind of skim it as I say this because there's a, a guy named Kevin DeYoung who kind of summarizes this chapter. So I want to highlight it and uh, just look, man, this is a great chapter. Okay, he says... Uh, uh, Kevin DeYoung points out, he went on to tell of God's promise to create new heavens and a new earth. That's verse 17. Okay, Isaiah 65, 17. A place where former things will not be remembered, where the sound of weeping is no longer heard, where infants do not die and old men do not perish, where labor will not be in vain, where the wolf will lie down with the lamb and where no one will hurt or destroy in all the Lord's holy mountain. Okay, so that's 17 through 25 kind of sums all that up. I mean, that sounds like a great description already, right? And that's just kind of what's happening here. Um, Revelation 21 uh, is kind of like the tail end of the Bible. It enhances this. It, it mentions all of those things, but it goes on to describe in further detail a little bit more about the new heaven and the new earth. Um, and then... In the explicit gospel by Matt Chandler, when we're talking about this idea of new, a new heaven and a new earth, th there is such a great nuance to this that I want you to latch on to, okay? New heaven and new earth. In, in Revelation 21 and also in 2 Peter where this is mentioned again, the Greek word for new is kainos, not neos. Okay, now kainos means new in nature or in quality. Okay, a new nature or a new quality, while neos means new in time or origin. In other words, when these passages employ the phrase new heaven a new earth they're positing a world renewed not a world brand new okay that's an important distinction it's a world renewed not a world brand new therefore what we see in the scripture's vision of the end of redemptive history is not an earth thrown in the trash can with its righteous inhabitants escaping to disembodied bliss in the clouds but a restored earth where creation has been reconciled to god Okay, so at the end of all time, when Jesus comes back to establish himself permanently on the throne, it is not going to be lighting a torch under earth and burning it all away and starting over brand new. It's taking what's already here and redeeming it and reconciling it to where creation is no longer groaning in frustration because of sin, because sin will be ultimately wiped out completely. There will be no remembrance of it. There will be no hint of it. There will be no temptation with it and when we look at creation it'll be completely restored not made brand new God doesn't have a plan B file up in heaven going come on I'm ready to crack this baby open it's like no 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 it's already here the blueprint the framework is here and when Jesus comes to restore things and wipe out sin everything gets renewed in new quality uh, in this book heaven by Randy Alcorn he says, God doesn't promise us a non-earth. He promises us a new earth. If the word earth in this phrase means anything, it means that we can expect to find earthly things there, including atmosphere, mountains, water, trees. But what the thing is, guys, is that in this new heaven and new earth, we should expect new atmosphere. What the heck does that even mean? We should expect new weather. We should expect new mountains. We should expect new rivers. We should expect new lakes. We should expect new trees. Now just imagine this. What if, what if the giant sequoias in California are really just the decorative bonsais of heaven? We expect newness where everything is restored into its former and future glory simultaneously. Stuff that is no longer wrecked by sin. Can you imagine the Grand Canyon not polluted by sin? Can you imagine Yosemite Valley not groaning in frustration because of sin? What? Can you imagine these places? So, number one, understanding that all of this will be new in nature and quality is huge for us. So when you look around, when you drive out to like Keystone Lake or something like that, you look at that and you go, this is still going to be here, but it's going to be renewed. I'm still going to be here, but I'm going to be renewed where sin no longer ravishes me. Keystone Lake is no longer ravished. The beaches of Bora Bora are no longer ravished by sin. So, and number two, we expect new earthly things in heaven. 
So Randy Alcorn says this, because ethereal notions of heaven have largely gone unchallenged, we often think of heaven as less real and less substantial than life here and now. Hence, we don't think of heaven as a place where people hug, and certainly not in these bodies. But in heaven, we won't be shadow people living in shadow lands. Instead, we'll be fully alive, fully physical, in a fully physical universe. So to wrap this first part up in a book I read called Journey to Joy, when, when you think about heaven like this and, and when you hear that bit of bad news in life that really just kind of rocks you to the core, you start to ask, what does that tell me about the fallen world and how glad does that make me that God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth and he is redeeming his people through his gospel? Let's go to Revelation 21 now. Let's talk about the reward of heaven. Revelation chapter 21, if you go towards where the maps are, turn like two pages to the left. Okay, Revelation chapter 21, we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. When you get there, stand up. Here, I want you to see this. Revelation 21, 3 through 4. What page is that if you're borrowing a mantle Bible? 1653. Cool. All right, Revelation 21, 3 through 4. Everybody good? Everybody standing up? Yeah. Okay. This is where it gets fun because we start talking about the reward. We talked a little. I mean, just the tiniest, tiniest bit about what heaven might look like. And that's already starting to go like, what? What in the world is Tahiti going to be like in heaven? Oh, my gosh. Now we get to talk about the reward, okay? So, Revelation 21, 3 through 4. Here we go. Read it with me. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Have a seat. Man, if that doesn't give you goosebumps, I don't know what will. The idea that there's no more mourning. I don't think there's going to be no more crying because you can cry tears of joy and that's a good, healthy thing. I mean, I did that watching like the soldiers coming home surprise, like homecoming videos. Man, what a, what a day for my allergies, you know? But when, when we get to heaven, there's going to be just this overabundance and overflowing of joy where there's not going to be hangnails and canker sores and broken fingers and broken toes and anything that people say that's going to hurt you and old baggage from old wounds. All of that's gone because we see that the old order of things has passed away, not just in nature, but also in relationships, in our personalities. The things that are off up here are going to be made right and brought back together. The things that are off in here are going to be made right and consolidated into what God always intended. It's not just going to be new trees and new rivers. It's going to be new hearts and new motivations and new desires and new passions. But the first thing that we get, the first reward is God himself. We are separated from God by time and space and sin. And according to this, God's dwelling is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He's coming back to be with us. Theologian Sam Storm says, we will be constantly more amazed with God, more in love with God, and thus ever more relishing His presence and our relationship with Him. Our experience of God will never reach its consummation. We will never finally arrive as if upon reaching a peak, we discover there's nothing beyond, like at Pike's Peak, like, well, this is it. No, 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 it's not so with God. Our experience of God will never become stale. It will deepen and develop, intensify and amplify, unfold and increase, broaden and balloon for all of eternity. Look at Revelation 117. Flip back a couple pages to Revelation 117. This is, oh gosh, guys, this is so fun to preach. Revelation 117. I cannot find it because I'm just jittery from adrenaline. There we go. All right, so you got Revelation 117. Somebody read that for me. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I were though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I'm the first of 
See, how great would that be if you ask a girl to prom and she's like, when I saw him, I fell. It was just as though dead. No, we're not that dreamy. What this is, is this is John seeing the resurrected Jesus in the new, earth, in the new heaven, the new earth. And when he sees him, he falls. What's it say? What does it say exactly? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. It's just one of those like, what kind of moments to where you get all weak in the knees and you just go down in a heap because of seeing Jesus for who he really is. All right, Randy Alcorn again says, when John saw Jesus in heaven, he fell at his feet as though dead. We will see Christ in his glory. The most exhilarating experiences on earth, like whitewater rafting, skydiving, extreme sports, will seem tame compared to the thrill of simply seeing Jesus. Flip back to Revelation 21 3 again. Revelation 21 3. What is Revelation 21 3? It says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will dwell with us. And there, that is so thick with imagery and implication. Because if God is going to dwell with us, that means that He is going to engage in life with us. Full life, real life, and give us the privilege of activity that is no longer futile. When we get to be with Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth, all of our activity becomes meaningful, not exhaustive. So let's talk about that activity. What are we going to do in heaven? In the new heavens and the new earth, magnifying God without tiring of it will be the duty, the delight, and the activity of all, shared by all who share the life of eternity. Augustine basically said, listen, all the energy, and this is cool, really key in on this. If you're sleepy, do something to wake up to hear this. All right, all the energy, all the vitality that your physical body spends in making itself function will be no more. Your liver won't need to clean your blood. Your kidneys won't have a cleansing function. You won't need those things anymore. Anymore because we're no longer deteriorating and decaying. All the energy that went into that now goes into praising, ruling, and reigning with God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine this? Randy Alcorn continues, We will glorify Him by ruling over the physical universe with creativity and camaraderie, showing respect and benevolence for all that we rule. We will be revealed at our resurrection when our adoption will be finalized and our bodies redeemed. We will be fully human with righteous spirits and incorruptible bodies. Guys, this is a dream come true. It's not we're going to just stand in rows for all of eternity going, how great thou art. No, no, no. We're going to use our creativity. We're going to use our capacity for relationship. We're going to use every cell that is no longer breaking down and splitting and trying to use all that. We're going to use all of this, all of the capacity that you have for learning and for wonder and for creativity and for leadership and for all of these things that are intrinsic in you right now. Now, those are going to be redeemed and restored and then redirected towards worshiping God. It's not a line of singing. It is an eternal life of constantly doing in a redeemed way, in a way that glorifies God. Randy Alcorn says this, we will, will we always be on our faces at Christ's feet worshiping Him? No, because scripture, scripture says we'll be doing many other things, living in dwelling places, eating and drinking, reigning with Christ, and working for Him. Scripture depicts people standing, walking, traveling in and out of the city, gathering at feasts. When doing these things, we won't be on our faces before Christ. Nevertheless, all that we do will be an act of worship. We'll enjoy full and unbroken fellowship with Christ. At times, this will crescendo into greater heights of of praise as we assemble with the multitudes who are also worshiping him not because we're doing nothing but worshiping but because we are worshiping God as we do everything else okay check that not because we're doing nothing but worshiping but because we are worshiping God as we do everything else gathering for a feast becomes worship running outside becomes worship Swimming in a river becomes worship. Singing remains worship. But all of this stuff gets enhanced and, and just, it'll explode your mind when it finally happens. The other reward that we get, not only do we get God himself, not only do we get activity that is no longer futile, but the other reward we get is freedom and rest. Y'all check this. Joseph Carroll said, perfect holiness 
is the aim of the saints on earth, and it is the reward of the saints in heaven. So let me ask you this. What is holiness? What does that mean? Do you guys know what holiness is or have a guess? This is the part where I'm going to need you to think and talk back because this is really cool. Do, does anybody know what holiness is or have a guess? I'll help you out, but... What have you heard? It's like complete and righteous. Complete, righteous, two separate things, but, but equal in the definition. Yeah, Holiness is complete and righteous. Anything else that you've heard that may add to that? Purity. Huh? Purity. Purity? Yeah? In what way? Without sin. Without sin. <laughs> yeah. Man, I can't, even, I can't even fathom that. Like, what would life be like? What would speech be like without sin getting in the way? Without questioning motives getting in the way. Without wondering, why didn't he text me back getting in the way? You know, what is it going to be like? Holiness is, is to separate from profane things. It's to be purified. It's to be whole. It's to be made righteous completely. So here's my question to you guys, and I want some, some feedback on this. If perfect holiness... Okay? If being perfectly separate from profane things, if being perfectly pure, being perfectly whole, perfectly righteous, if perfect holiness is our reward, what are some of the ways that, that, that help us experience this? Like, what are, what are we free from if we are perfectly holy? What do we have rest from if we're perfectly holy? And by implication, what? What are we, like? We're free from sin, yeah. But let's really drill down into that. What is that? What do we have rest from? What are we free from if we're free from sin? If we're perfectly holy, suffering. we're free from suffering. Okay, what else? Guilt. <laughs> free from guilt. Who said that? Come on, that's good stuff. Free from guilt. What else? Anxiety. We're free from anxiety. What? Come on, that's good. What else? Depression. We're free from depression. What else? Yeah. Free from death. <laughs> yeah. We're free from death and everything that goes along with death. How do we die? What happens to our bodies? They overwork themselves. They shut down. That does not happen anymore. You got that anxiety. Your heart rate's not going up. Blood pressure's not through the roof. What else do we find rest from if we're perfectly holy? Jealousy. Yes. What else? We find rest from what, huh? Exhaustion. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? We're not going to be exhausted anymore. Holy cow, I don't have to go home on Sunday and take a nap anymore because I gave everything I have right now. You know, like there's no more exhaustion. Holy cow, what else? What else are we free from? What else do we find rest from? <laughs> Ourselves, distraction. Come on. You guys are starting to warm up to this. And this is where it gets fun when we start just imagining the beauty of heaven. What are we free from? What do we find rest from? Status? Yes! What else? What goes with that? Like, what all goes into status and maintaining that? A perfect Instagram picture. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's no more selfies in heaven. Mm -hmm. What? What? <laughs> what else? What else are we free from? What do we find rest from if we're perfectly holy? That's our reward, which means we no longer have to... Insecure. Yeah, we don't have to be insecure anymore. We don't have to wonder about that. We're going to be fully known and see Jesus fully for who he is. The insecurity thing is, what, is a barrier. It's a separator. And when, when everything is restored, all of that separation is gone. Wah! What else? Yeah, we won't. We will not be one-upping each other anymore. No more trash talk about how bad Aggie football is at the end of the season. Oh, I can't wait for that. You know? What else? Huh? We'll be free from loss. Yeah, we won't even lose our keys anymore. I mean, come on. Tile is going to be out of business. What else? Huh? Free from fear. Yep, we just sang that this morning. Like, that's a desire of our hearts that we don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid of clowns. Guess what? Don't got to be anymore. It's going to be great. I can't wait. I'll be like, I'm a room of a clown, man. Come on. Like, it's going to be awesome. We're going to be free from fear. What else? What else are we free from? What do we find rest from? This is so good, man. If this isn't like making your heart just go like, oh, I kind of like this. Something's wrong. What are we free from? Because we're perfectly holy. Anger. Free from anger. Oh, come on. You're speaking my language. I can't wait for that. 
<laughs> what else? Bad drivers. <laughs> We're free from bad drivers. Yeah, that's gonna be awesome, man. I don't even know. Are we gonna drive? What does is, what is a redeemed car look like? Are we gonna drive? I don't even know. Maybe we'll just walk everywhere. Maybe maybe we'll be like Jesus though. And remember, Jesus could like walk through walls and stuff. Yeah, like the the current in Finding Nemo. Do you have your exit, buddy? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's a funny image. I mean, what if? What if though? Like, what if that's how we travel, and not just here in Oklahoma, but through the entire universe? <gasps> oh man. So you guys are kind of getting this right. We are free from all of these things, all of these things that shackle us now. There's freedom in that because of perfect holiness. Now, here's here's another question. How many of y'all enjoy the great outdoors? Just show of hands. You don't go. Yeah, most of us do. What about that makes us love it? Lots of space. Lots of space. Uh huh. Yeah. The trees don't judge you. The tree. Yes, the trees don't judge you. They just sap on you. But uh, <laughs> that's good though. You can start a fire with sap. Um, what I love about great outdoors and all these stories of like going to the, the Canadian uh, boundary waters or going down to the Rio Grande, the lower canyons of the Rio Grande, or going to Alaska, it's just that adventure. Like feeling like I just discovered something that no one else has seen or none of my friends have seen. You know, <laughs> like when I'm camping in a cave on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande illegally, uh, but, and then in the middle of the night, like you hear like footprints going through the water. I'm like, I hope those are cows. I hope those are cows. I don't have anything to defend myself. I hope those are cows. Like there's a thrill to that of just being out in the wild, knowing that I am a hundred miles from anyone and whatever happens is all, like, there's just a thrill to that. Now check this out. Randy Alcorn says this, we are pilgrims pilgrims on this earth that is passing away. We know that. We know this is not our home. We know it's got to be better than this, right? So we are pilgrims here on this earth that is passing away. Oh, but check this. Eventually we'll be pioneers and settlers on the new earth. The restoration of the current universe al alone. Let me say that again. The restoration of the current universe alone will provide unimaginable territories for us to explore and establish dominion over to God's glory. So if you're thinking heaven is just a place where like there's these golden buildings and mansions and like a pool with a roller coaster that goes through it, man, you're thinking way too small. Creation itself has been groaning since the beginning when Adam and Eve first sinned. And that's not just talking about the Middle East or South America or the Poles. That's talking about every, every uncharted galaxy, every star that we have not discovered yet, every little atom in the entire scope of the known and the unknown universe is going to be redeemed and brought under the, the dominion and the rule of Christ. And we are going to get to do that. What? Now that little, little current thing, that's starting to sound pretty cool, huh? Like, I'm going to go to Alpha Centauri. That'd be great. You know? Can you imagine these, these territories we get to explore in the perfect holiness that is ours because of Jesus? So let me wrap this up here. We will be free from sin and therefore free from that which separates us from God. That in itself is like, yes. So where sin and shame made Adam and Eve and us hide behind fig leaves and bushes in this new freedom will joyfully fulfill the psalmist soliloquy when he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. We will be set free to set the universe universe free in all its parts that have been groaning since the garden. And in the fulfillment of such a grand purpose, we will experience rest because striving for approval and advantage will cease. All of our efforts, all of our activity, all of our exploration will perfectly glorify the God who dwells among us, with us. And in that, there is peace peace that we cannot know on this side of heaven, a peace that we restlessly long for until we see Jesus grin, clap his hand on our backs and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. This is what heaven is like. This is the consummation of the story. 
Man, doesn't that sound better than singing for 10,000 years? Doesn't that sound like a heaven you'd want to tell your friends about? Doesn't that sound like something you don't want to miss? Let's pray.